Okay, well, welcome everyone to today's webinar. This is LibGuides, Lib Answers, and Lib Analytics presented by Southeastern New York Library Resources Council. My name is Carolyn Bennett Glauda, and I work at CineLurk representing New York's Hudson Valley. Our host today is Jane Verostek, Associate Librarian at Moon Library at SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry um, up in beautiful Syracuse, New York. Before we begin, I just have a few items of note. If you are having any technical difficulties with Adobe Connect, my colleague Zach is here to help you. He's on the line now and he can give you assistance either via phone, um, email, or chat. Um, we also have a special guest at the end of the webinar. Uh, Talia Richards of Springshare will be joining us for a Q&A directly after the scheduled finish of the webinar. So if you have an extra half hour or so at three o'clock, we hope you can stay on the line. And yes, hello, Talia. Welcome. And I have to change your slide. Uh, so this is a live interactive webinar, and we encourage you to participate. Jane and I are both using voice over IP to connect today, and we hope that we're coming in loud and clear. Jane, do you want to say hi to everyone just to give it a good test? Jane's muted at the moment. Oh, this is Jane from Syracuse. OK, hi, Jane. So. Um, if we're the only two with audio enabled, so if you have anything to add, please use the chat box. And if you're not hearing um, either of us clearly, make sure your speakers are set up and um, on properly. And if that's the case, please let Zach know about your audio issues. Uh, another way that you can participate today is by using the raise hand icon, which is located at the top of your browser. Uh, you can generally use um, yes for agree and uh, or agree for yes and disagree for no and you can press the applause button if the mood strikes you. We'll do our best to keep an eye out for raised hands so that you can participate and ask questions that you might have for Jane. Uh, because this webinar is being recorded, don't worry if you need to step away or, or if you miss something. I'll do my best to have the full recording up on our website this week, and I will send you that link along with an evaluation. And one last thing before we begin, I have um, an interesting, exciting piece of news. As you may know, uh, CineLurk is one of nine councils that make up the NY3Rs, and I would like to extend a welcome to those of you who have joined from other councils. Starting in 2016, the NY3Rs will be known as ESLN, or Empire State Library Network. Uh, we're doing this to better reflect what the work that we do as the, uh, the councils, the nine councils of New York State. So you'll start seeing these changes coming um, in the next few weeks, and I just wanted to let you consider this your sneak preview of our new name and our new logo. And uh, in the meantime, I think we're all really excited to learn more about LibGuides. So without further ado, uh, please use your applause button to give Jane a warm welcome. <laughs> all righty, well, thank you, thank you. Um, this is our intro slide, and I think a lot of you saw this description when you registered um, for this webinar. But just to review, I'm gonna talk about LibGuides, Lib Analytics um, and Lib Answers, three Spring Share products. Those are the three main ones that we use. There are others, but those are the three that we use. And I, I've been doing this presentation at a number of library councils, and I also did this at NYLA because I like to share how we at Moon Library at the SUNY College of Science and Forestry moved everything in our reference desk files and all of our handouts um, and all of our little tick sheets for reference, how we moved it all to an online environment uh, using these three tools. So I'm going to talk about these three tools and I have um, close to 60 slides because I do have a lot of screen captures. Um, and again, after I move through the slides and we talk about the three products and how we use them, there'll be uh, time at the end for a Q&A with someone from SpringShare. So let's go ahead and we'll move through. Um, so this is just a link to uh, remind you of the SpringShare website, springshare.com. And um, before we start talking about, I'm going to talk about LibGuides first. If everybody could use the little person and um, using the raised hand, can you tell me how many people online here are using LibGuides already? Okay, so about half of the people are currently using LibGuides. Um, just out of curiosity, can you keep your hand raised if, if you are also using Lib Answers too? Anybody using Lib Answers? Not so many. And how about Lib Analytics? Is anybody out there using Lib Analytics? That's that really cool software I'm going to talk about at the end where we can keep track of all of our reference questions. And just a few, just three people. So 
this will be good for everyone to, to get an overview of all the three products and how we've been using them here at Moon Library. Um, so in the summer of 2012, we purchased a license for LibGuides, and all of our staff here at Moon Library can create LibGuides, and I have to give you a little background here. We're, uh, we're a very small library. Um, we, we actually have multiple libraries in the Adirondacks, but the main library at our campus only has nine staff members. We have three clerks, three librarians, a secretary, a systems person, and a, and a library director. So we only have nine staff. So we empower everyone here to take ownership, and if they have an idea for a LibGuide, to, to go ahead and maybe mentor up with someone else that has been doing LibGuides and, and create that LibGuide. And we also allow our interns um, to do LibGuides, but we do pair them up with someone on staff that has already been doing LibGuides. I'm um, going a little bit about our campus just to give you an idea of our size. We have about 1,600 undergraduate students usually and 600 graduate students. And we have a really wide range of majors. So some of our majors are landscape architecture, environmental sciences, chemistry, biology. So we have a, a real wide range, which is why it's so great to have the LibGuides. And I'll get into that when we talk about what we use the LibGuides for. So we use our LibGuides to create kind of like a customizable website almost, an online portal for any kind of information. So we have all these different majors that we have, and we need to be doing guest lectures, and we need to be doing outreach. So we have LibGuides for different classes that we teach. And then we also have LibGuides for general things, like we have a whole LibGuide on interlibrary loan. We have a whole LibGuide on how to do grants research. Um, and we, we, um, we were able to customize our URL. You can see it there. It's libguides.esf.edu slash resources. So when you do go on with LibGuides or LibAnswers or LibAnalytics, you can customize what your URL looks like, which is really handy um, when you're giving it out to people. So obviously, LibGuides can be accessed anywhere that you have the internet, and the changes that you make are immediate. And what I really like about this is that you can customize the name of your LibGuides. So I mentioned we use LibGuides for a lot of our outreach and a lot of our guest lectures. So, for example, we have a huge program on our campus called ESF in the High School. And so I'm out there all the time lecturing to the high school kids coming on campus. Then they leave campus to go back to their home school, and I can give them this LibGuide link. And anywhere they have Internet, they can use this link to continue on with their research. So LibGuides will let you change that name and tweak it. And so you can put in a word or words there, and it's so easy for people to find your LibGuide. So I love this screen capture. This is, um, I've been taking um, a screen capture as I've been doing the workshops on LibGuides throughout the years. And there's a really great community site for LibGuides. Um, if you haven't been there, you should really go check it out because it's a great place to get ideas, ideas for topics and for styles. Um, maybe there's a guide you've been thinking about doing, but you're not sure how you should format it, or maybe you think you're missing some information on your guide, you can go to this community site and you can see the numbers, the difference from June of 2012 to just when I did this the other day, but the number of guides that are available is astronomical. Um, they now have over 430,000 guides uh, that you can look at. And what's really neat is when you go to the community site, you can put in a keyword. So if I'm looking to do a guide on grants, I can put in grants. And then I can limit it and say, well, I'm only looking for LibGuides that have been done by academic libraries. Or maybe I'm a public library. I can, I can actually limit it by the kind of library that has done a guide. And this is a great place to get ideas. I always like to show this because it shows the power of how many LibGuides are available. So this is a screen capture of our home page. And down at the bottom in the lower left, you'll see that it says Locate Research Guides. So when we came on board with LibGuides, um, we met as a staff and we decided to, for the public at least, to change the name to Research Guides. We thought that it would be more intuitive for students to see Research Guides. So when you go on our homepage, you'll see a link that says Locate Research Guides. And when you click on that link, it'll take you, and I'm sorry, this is a little fuzzy, but it'll take you to a list of all of our LibGuides. So we right now have about 50 LibGuides. 
And as soon as you get to that page, it'll list out all the guides. You can narrow it down and say, just let me see the guides by different subjects. And when you create a guide, you actually give it a subject. So we would put in chemistry or biology. And then type. When you create a guide, you have to give it a type. And those are things that are predefined by SpringShare. So there's, for example, a course, general purpose. So you have to give it the predefined type. And then by owner. So if I'm giving a workshop, for example, on LibGuides, I might go to by owner and then look at all my LibGuides all grouped together. Another neat thing about um, this page, this front page for when you go to your LibGuides, is that there's a search box. So out of all these 50 guides, if I'm not seeing the one I want, maybe I remember, I'm a student, I, I vaguely remember there being a LibGuide mentioned for my class, I can go in and put in the teacher's name or the class here, and it'll bring it up. It'll search all those LibGuides for me. Another neat thing here is there's a drop-down box. So right now it's displaying all of our LibGuides by popularity, but I can resort that. So maybe I want to look at all the guides alphabetically. Or maybe I want to look at the newest guides that have been created. So just this little tiny screen capture gives you so many options for gaining access into your LibGuides. And this is what the public will see. All right, my next um, screen capture is going to show you one of my actual LibGuides here. And this is an example of um, one of the LibGuides I've done where I've embedded video. And so I, I embed video in almost all of my LibGuides because I do a lot of outreach, and I also teach a completely online class. So I take all of my videos and I reuse them in my different LibGuides. So this is just an example of how I've embedded the video. Um, I also do a lot of workshops on things like Blackboard and other databases that we have that maybe people haven't used yet. And so I feel the need to add in screen captures. If someone hasn't been in Blackboard or they haven't used the database yet, I'd like to give them a, a viewing or a showing of what the screens look like. And in LibGuides, you can drop in screen captures, which is really nice. And I should mention, um, when you're looking at the LibGuides that I've done, this one has it. Over on the right-hand side, you have the option in your LibGuide to have a little box all about you. So that on all of your LibGuides, it's like a little stamp. This guide was created by Jane, and it has your contact information on there. And then it has any subjects that I've added in so people know what, what I'm all about here at ESF, that I do archives, that I'm the liaison to environmental studies, and that I teach and do research. So you have that option to display that, or you can hide it. On the previous LibGuide, I had hid it, I think because I had a lot going on here. But you can have that box appear on all of your LibGuides and you can place it wherever you want um, and again that's a great way to put ownership on your LibGuide have people know who you are and how to contact you. Another great thing that we have been using LibGuides for uh, and this has been fantastic has been using LibGuides for finding aids for our archives. Our archives was closed for three years we just recently reopened it and so I've been creating LibGuides about unique collections that we have, and I've been able to embed a lot of images that we have. So I'll, I'll give them a little um, sampling of some images that maybe we've digitized, and then I'll give them the link to the actual maybe New York Heritage or Digital Public Library where we host them. But this has been a great opportunity, again, to use this as a finding aid and to give them a sampling of photographs. So it's been really great to be able to embed uh, images and photographs. Uh, another thing I should mention too is the portability of LibGuides is just incredible. Once you create this, once I have that, that LibGuide created and that, that URL where I've given it a really user-friendly name where I've changed the name at the end, um, I can go out and I can go anywhere where I have internet and do a guest lecture. So I was invited to talk to some emeriti off campus at a luncheon that they have and they wanted to know about archives. So I just went online and I was able to bring up all of my LibGuides and lecture from that. I think the, the portability of doing this is just fantastic. You don't have to bring anything with you. You just have to make sure that you have the Internet. Um, this is another great thing we've done with LibGuides. Um, we are part of the SUNY system. And um, we 
We had to decide what we wanted to do about organizing our databases, which was a very difficult decision. Uh, we could either go with the software that SUNY had picked overall, or we could go out on our own and create our own database page. So that's what we did, and we used a LibGuide. So this page is how all of our students access all of our licensed databases. And it's really incredible. There's a tab for every letter, so you can look alphabetically. Uh, you can search the databases here. We have little boxes that tell people not sure where to get started. You can click here. We have boxes that have our newest databases and our newest journals. And it's just amazing that, that we've been able to create this on our own and have this be our portal for our databases. And of course, this is the, the LibGuide that gets the most hits, I think, right now. It has about 24,000 hits, and we just put this up this summer. Um, but this is our main databases page, so it's just amazing to show the difference. I can use it for something simple, like an archival LibGuide, or something very complex as a database page. Okay, this is what you see behind the scenes. All the other pages were what the public sees. These are all, all LibGuide screen captures of what I would see as a patron. But this is what you see when you log in as a staff member. So the standard thing for SpringShare is to have um, a dashboard, that orangey yellow bar running across the top. And there's a drop down menu where you can navigate to all the products that you use for SpringShare. So right now we're only using LibGuide, LibAnswers, and LibAnalytics. But you can see there's other options here. There's other products. So you would just use that to navigate to what you're going to do. And this is the page where you would create a guide. There's a plus sign right there. It says create guide. Or if you'd started a guide, there's a box to edit an existing guide. So when you're creating a guide, you have to give it some basic information, obviously a name. That'll appear at the top of your LibGuide. That's not the URL. That's the name that appears at the top. And a description, a blurb about it. This is where you put in the type of LibGuide, and again, that's that's a um, a limited list here. It's general purpose, course, or subject. Then I think there's one more. I think it's topic. And this is also where you decide if you would like to enable sharing of your LibGuide. So back on the community website for all the LibGuides, those 400 some odd thousand LibGuides. You can actually find one and contact the person if they've checked off the box that they've enabled sharing. So if you find a LibGuide on the community site and you want to copy all or part of it, if they've enabled sharing, you can contact that person and say, I, I, I really would like to repurpose, reuse some or all of your LibGuide. Uh, may I? You know, you have to ask for permission. But that's what that, there's an option here about sharing here. And that's the great thing about the community site is that you can use it to get started and get ideas. And I, I was mentioning this a second ago here. You can go to the LibGuide community site to get ideas. Um, you could use a LibGuide that a colleague has already created and you could use it as a template, change it, update it. Or you could start from scratch. There's three different ways that you can do LibGuide. So once you have a, a group of, of LibGuides under your belt, so to speak, you can reuse your LibGuides. I really like that format. I really like how I have those columns laid out. Then you can just copy that LibGuide, and you can change the information on it. But the first step is creating one from scratch. Um, or you could copy one from a colleague, or again, get one from the community site um, asking permission from the other creator. This is when you're inside the LibGuide and you're editing. So this is my ESF and the high school LibGuide. And there's a little blue pencil kind of on a diagonal throughout the LibGuide. And that shows where you can do edits. So anytime you see that pencil, you can edit the text. And then there's also a plus sign option, um, which is enabling you to edit or add content. And I'm going to show you some more screen captures here. This is when you're editing a box, you can go in, and this is where you'll be adding in text and links and embedding things like your videos and um, any images you have. There's a whole separate toolbar inside the text box. So again, when I'm in the basic 
editing mode here. I can click on the pencil and I can edit my box or I can click on the plus sign and I can be editing and adding content. So my next screen um, talks about adding adding a brand new box. So maybe I need to add a whole new box to the that that page right here. There's a, a blue plus sign and it says add box. It's as simple as that. I click on that. I give the box a name. What am I calling this this area? Is it a tour of the library? Is it a list of citation managers? Is it, is it a list of grant resources? I can call it anything I want. And once I say save, then I'm back to that screen. I'll take you back here. I'm back to the screen where I can actually edit the content of the box. So once I have all my boxes up, um, you can move them and you can change the layout. So maybe you've got a lot going on. Well, I want to change it to three columns of boxes. Or maybe I want to change the size of the columns. So there's a, a, a drop down menu called layout. And it's so simple to change your layout. And, um, and again, I haven't mentioned this yet, but no one can see what you're doing at this point. Um, this is all unpublished so you can play around with the, with the formatting and with the sizes and the layout here. So as I mentioned no one can see what you're doing because as soon as you start to create a libguide it's unpublished. But when you're ready for other people to see it over in the upper right hand side there's a drop down menu and all you have to do is change it to published and then it becomes available to everyone out there. Now if you're not ready to publish it yet, but you want to see what it looks like, there's an eyeball right next to that drop-down menu. And if you click on the eyeball, it'll show you what it'll look like to the public. And I do that a lot um, to, to double-check, you know, maybe I have a, a major typo in there that the spell check didn't catch, or I don't really like how the formatting worked out. But there is an eyeball where you can preview what it looks like before you choose to publish it. And I mentioned this before, uh, when you create a libguide, it gets, of course, the generic URL, like we're all used to, very large URLs. But you can very easily customize your URL. I do this for all my libguides. Right next to the long URL, there's a little pencil, and you click on it, and you can change the name of your libguide. It's always going to be the main thing, so for us it's libguides.esf.edu, and then I can change it. I can change it to the class I'm teaching. EWP 101. I can change it to the database that I'm creating a libguide for. libguides.esf.edu slash scifinder. And that way it's easier when I give to people, it's easier when I email them, and it, and it, it really works out to give um, that connectivity, that identity, rather than leaving it as the generic URL. When you're all done and you have a group of libguides, this is really important to do um, when you're in your libguides dashboard when you're logged into libguides and you've got that orange bar going across the top your dashboard it's really important um, to go in and check your links occasionally so there's a drop down menu called tools off that orange dashboard and there's something called link checker and I just ran this the other day I was so surprised we had so many here um, but there's a list here and it'll tell me all the links that are bad and it tells me where what libguide it's on and who owns the libguide um, so then we need to go in individually and we need to um, check those URLs and update them and so you would need to do this periodically once you have a group of libguides very important to do uh, this is one of my favorite things about libguides I love this um, on the on the orange toolbar going across on the dashboard there's a button called statistics and so right now I have a screen capture that shows you um, you can get statistics for all the guides and then all the guides that everyone on the staff creates are all listed here it starts with my guides and then it goes and it'll show everyone else's guides and then I can put in a range here and then I can run a report to see how many people are viewing the libguides. It's, it's really amazing to see, to get that visual of the usage. Um, so this is just showing a chart 
of all of our LibGuide usage. I think I put in um, it was about a six-month period there. But it's great to see the highs and the lows of when people are using the LibGuides. And uh, this is one for just one of one LibGuide. This is my ESF in the high school LibGuide. So if you're wondering, you know, how much is my LibGuide getting used and when is it getting used? This is a great way to see this, again, under statistics. And I can see, for example, the highs and lows of when my LibGuide's being used. Maybe I need to be doing more to promote it. Um, in this case, maybe I need to do more to get the word out with the high school students. So it gives you an idea of the usage. So these are my takeaways um, that I just like to share overall. Uh, to remember that you can customize the name of your LibGuide, and I think that's a, a, a simple thing to do and an obvious thing to do. I think viewing statistics is just amazing uh, that you can do that. Um, also, checking your links is very important to do. Remembering that when you create a LibGuide that it's unpublished and that no one can see it until you click on that drop-down menu and choose Published. And then when you first create your LibGuide, you decide if you want other people to be able to reuse your information in that community site. Um, when you're creating your LibGuide, there's a description box, and what you're entering in there is searchable via the Internet. So when I'm creating the LibGuide and I put a description, I try to put in a lot of keywords so that people can find it if they're just searching online. And I'm always on the lookout for new opportunities. When we reopened the archives, I said, geez, I said, we should be creating finding aids for all these things in the archives, and LibGuides is the obvious way to do it. So you need to always be on the lookout. And here at SUNY ESF, we have something called the Liaison Program, where each librarian is a liaison to a different department. So we're always checking in with our faculty, which they then check um, in with their, their staff and their students to see, you know, what do we need to do? Is there a, a LibGuide that we need to do on a database? Is there a LibGuide we need to be doing for your class? And then, of course, you need to be promoting your LibGuide. So we get the word out a number of ways. We have old-fashioned table tents. We have signs throughout our stacks. We have a giant TV that hangs in our library that talks about it. And we're regularly contacting, uh, through our liaison program, our faculty to remind them that there's these LibGuides out there. Yeah, the QR codes are um, actually, we kind of trick the students. We have these table tents out with the QR code. And when we teach our, we have a credit library class. And, and one of the questions when we give them a tour of the library is we tell them to go scan a QR code. So it's doing double duty. They, they're finding the QR code. And then they're also getting to these much needed resources, these LibGuides and these LibAnswers. So you can do all this work on these LibGuides, but then you really need to get the word out wherever you can. So that's um, all I'm going to say about LibGuides. Oops, I have one more slide about cost. And this is the slide that I had when we purchased it. And um, Talia can talk maybe about the prices later if anybody has questions. but um, the pricing when we bought it was based on the size of our institution, <clears throat> and this gives you an idea of what the pricing ranges are. So after we um, purchased LibGuides, we we were on the fence about what brought this on is we were on the fence about joining a group of 24/7 reference access, and if we wanted to join the group and as you know how that works, you would participate and you would you would have certain hours that you would be doing 24-7 access. And instead, we decided to go with LibAnswers. Um, and what LibAnswers has done for us has essentially created a 24-7 reference service. So I'll show how LibAnswers works for us. Um, so what LibAnswers does, it creates an online forum for reference questions and answers. And it essentially creates a huge database of frequently asked questions. And so here's the link. It's just springshare.com again, but it's LibAnswers. And again, I, I always like the power of numbers here. Uh, so when I started talking about LibAnswers in the summer of 2012, um, the LibAnswers community site only had 167,000 answered questions. 
And if you look at the number from the other day, uh, that just speaks volumes uh, that this month the Lib Answers community site has a little over 650,000 answered questions. Uh, it's a really powerful tool, and I'm going to show you how we use it here and give you some screen captures. So in the summer of 2012, we purchased the license, and I'm going to show you some screen captures of um, the administrative side of, of what it looks like. And again, you have that orange bar across the top, that dashboard, and there's a pull-down menu that I use to get to this where you pick, you know, I'm doing lib answers today. I'm doing lib guides. So I'm picking lib answers. And it will show you all the different setup that you need to do. So for us, we changed the name again, um, just like we did for lib guides. We changed lib answers to library FAQ. Again, making it a little more user friendly. Um, and we put in information about our web page and about our contact information here. Uh, there's also a very important setting here in the lower right hand corner about um, all are all answers private by default so when people ask a question uh, we have to decide if it's public or private um, so we say no and then we decide when we answer the question because sometimes we get questions in that have personal information or the research is ongoing, especially if it's an archives question. We can decide if it's public and it goes into the database or if it's private. So this is another screen capture of the administrative side where you're just picking colors. And very important where you're picking, um, oh, this isn't the page, sorry, where you're picking, it's the next page here, where you're picking the hours. So when, you, when I show you the public side, um, it'll show you when we're available. So we, we do say that we're mainly answering the questions when the librarians are here from 9 to 6. Um, but as the questions come in and as we answer them, it has built this amazing database of frequently asked questions, and it runs on its own. So this is what we see behind the scenes. So when I log into my Lib Answers, I can see the queue of questions. So it tells me the date and time it came in, and then it you have to claim it. So all the staff here get notified when a question comes in. There's only nine of us. We all get an email saying, a new question has arrived by Lib Answers. And so the way we work it is, who's ever officially designated to be on reference claims the question. So we all got the email saying a new question came in, but who's ever on call answers the question, they claim it. And then from there you decide if I'm going to make it public and build it into the FAQ or if I'm going to make it private. Um, in fact, the example that I have shown is I was, I was actually working on this one. It was for an author and they were doing some research on a book and that's something that I would make private, for example. And I mentioned these uh, tips before. So, um, when you're setting up your lib answers, um, you need to be looking for ideas. So you could go to the community site and you could get ideas for what other questions and answers people have put in. And what we did is we bought this in the summer, which was perfect because we spent the summer going through all of our handouts at our reference desk and all of our informational sheets and we cheated. We pre-populated the lib answers. So we put in questions and answers so it would have something when the students came back in September. So we could have waited until September and had students ask, you know, do you have a scanner in the library? Or how do I get to the databases off campus? Um, just simple questions that we knew we were going to get asked. We went ahead and the summer, that summer, we went ahead and we put in the questions and answers and built the database up so that it would be there for when the students came back. And we, of course, when we got the software, we, through our liaison program, we sent out an email to our faculty to see if they had any ideas about Lib Answers and what they could suggest for adding in. But I think that was one of the best things we did was pre-populating it. So this is what the public sees when they're on our homepage and they go to Library FAQ because we changed the name for the public. They will see a list of questions and and, the, and they can go to the answers here. So how do I get to ESF resources off campus? 
Um, does Moon Library have Wi-Fi? How do I find out if you have the e version of a particular journal? So they can sort the answers, most popular answers, most recent answers. Or what's really great, and this is when we're we're closed. We're open till 11:30 at night, um, but it's inevitable that somebody's going to have a question after that. They can go into that Ask Us box, and they can put in a full question or just a few keywords, and it will automatically look through all of those questions and answers and find the match. So it has built the, the database for us. As questions get asked and answered, it's building this frequently asked database for us. Um, also on the side, there's a box, and you set this all up behind the scenes. There's a box that gives them the number where they can text us, where they can call us. They can tweet us. They can email us. And then, of course, we have information on face-to-face -face if they want to come in and, and actually see a librarian. So right from the screen, they can submit their question. And again, once they submit the question, all the staff get an email saying, a new question has arrived via LibAnswers. So who's ever designated to be on reference at the time claims it and answers it. And that person decides, is it public? Do I put it in this database for other people to see? Or is it something that's really private? And again, that's usually the questions relating to archives. You know, somebody emailed me the other day and they wanted photographs of their grandfather, um, things like that. And what's really great about this is uh, we get questions literally 24-7, and they a lot seem to come in on the weekends. And so if it's not being found in the database that exists, they can send us an email and we'll automatically get the question. And of course, um, statistics with Lib Answers, you can see statistics. And this is kind of um, this is when we were first setting it up. I think we were playing with it to to play with the the different um, questions we were adding. Um, but here you can see all the kinds of questions and answers. So public questions, private questions, and how the questions are coming in. So were they asked via Twitter? Did somebody email them? This is I, I can tell this is from when we were first setting it up. And how many were entered via staff entry? How many did we pre-populate? So back on that dashboard, that orange bar under Lib Answers, there's going to be an option for statistics, and you can get all these statistics on what kind of questions are coming in. It's just amazing. So these are my takeaways. Um, we do have, a, we actually have a student worker do this. We have a student worker go through our our frequently asked questions to make sure that they're up to date. You know, maybe there's a service that we changed. Um, maybe something's happened. We did actually change our provider for our proxy server, and so getting into our databases off campus changed. So we do have a student, and all they do every semester is sit and make sure that the answers that we're giving people are still up to date. So there is some maintenance. Um, it's really important to remember to run your spell check um, before you click that you're answering a question and putting it in that database. And we, along with LibAnswers, use LibGuides together. So if we're answering somebody's question about how do I do interlibrary loan, we can then link them to our LibGuide about interlibrary loan. So they tie in together. And of course, you want to promote the LibAnswers. So again, we have traditional table tents. We put information around the stacks. Uh, we put information in highly populated areas, like by the vending machines. Um, and we even sometimes go around campus to the bulletin boards that the students are always looking at, and we, we we'll tap we'll we'll tack up some of our table tents just flat. So we try to get the word out about Lib Answers. Okay, the next, oh, oh, and I have to talk about cost. Sorry, I always have a cost slide here. So this is the, the slide from when we purchased LibAnswers to give you an idea of the cost. And again, it's based on your size. Um, so this is, again, giving you an idea of, of the cost involved. We, we have found it to be just so valuable. Again, at the time that we bought it, we were going to go with, are we going to join a group and do 24-7 reference? 
but instead we chose lib answers and it's it's really been beneficial to us because we can build it ourselves and we can choose what goes in it all right the last thing i'm going to talk about is um let me just get to my slides here lib analytics and can everybody raise their hand again? Is anybody here again using Lib Analytics? I think there were three people, but I'm not sure. Anybody, and if you can raise your hand, are you using Lib Analytics at all? No, no one here is using Lib Analytics. Um, Lib Analytics started out um, because our library director kept having to submit statistics. And to be honest with you, um, it was really hard. To do, uh, he had to submit statistics to certain SUNY organizations about what kind of reference questions we were answering, how many, and um, it was really difficult because we had a binder with sheets and we would have to put tick marks in it about the kinds of questions, and then we would have a, a place for narrative to jot down notes to each other about, you know, well, there was a big assignment and there's a big group that seems to be coming in today. It was it was um, very archaic and. And every year when he would go to do statistics, it just, it was just terrible. We couldn't seem to get good statistics from that way of doing it through those tick sheets and through those notes. Um, for a brief time, we tried a, a blog where we went online and we created a Moon Library reference blog. But um, not everyone was, was doing the blog. We had issues with privacy because it wasn't a private blog. And so... Since we were already using the other SpringShare products, Lib, Lib Answers and Lib Guides, we decided to give Lib Analytics a try, and it's it's been uh, fantastic. Um, and so we started using this about two years ago. And so what we did, and I'll show you the screen captures, is um, we've created a template so that every single time a question is asked at our main reference circulation desk, and I should say, when you walk into Moon Library, we have a combined reference circulation desk. So when you walk in on one side, we usually have a student worker who's working the circulation desk. And on the other side is either an intern who's getting their master's degree in library science or a librarian. So when either person gets a question, they're entering it into Lib Analytics. So let's show you what this looks like. So again, You've got that orange dashboard at the top, that toolbar. I would be using a drop-down menu to say I'm doing Lib Analytics this time as opposed to the other SpringShare products. And this is what I would see as a staff member. The public doesn't see this at all. So I can see every question that's been input by everyone on our staff. So when someone comes up to the desk after a transaction is done, we will log on, and we always, we always have it logged on, but we'll go to add a new record. Up at the top it says add record. And I type in the information about what just happened. What was that person asking? Who were they? How long did it take? How hard was the question? So this is the screen about how we enter in our reference questions. So we looked at our old paper system, and we thought about, the things that we needed to record that we weren't really doing a good job of recording and what kind of statistics that we would be asked for for certain reports from certain groups like SUNY um, and, and other groups that may ask for our reference statistics. So I don't have the screen that shows the administrative side to this but on the administrative side you would choose in this template what you would be listing here. So where it says, where are you, you would decide what would be the where are you options. Were you at the reference desk, were you in your office, or were you outside of the library? Question source. Again, you would decide what these are. Was it a consultation, a drop-in, a telephone question? Did it come in via Lib Answers? Did it come in via email? And again, you would be picking these. You'd meet as a group and decide, well, what, what kinds of... Um, items do we need to have in each of these menus here. Under question type, again, you'd want to decide what are the kind of question types that we may get. Basic research, printer assistance is a big one for us. 
um, directions, equipment troubleshooting, equipment instruction, and the list goes on. Archives, lost and found. So when we sat down to do this template, we had a lot to think about, and you can add to this, you can change this over time. Um, but we needed to make this so that anyone on staff could use this, our student workers up to the library director, so who's ever at the desk. Uh, over on the right hand side, it says who asked. So again, you need to decide who am I putting in here? ESF undergrad student, ESF graduate student, ESF faculty, ESF staff, SU, right next to Syracuse University, and we get a lot of their students that come over. Um, further down, there's an unknown option, because sometimes you just can't get a feel for who you're working with, and there's an option for unknown. Uh, how many in the group? This was important to us, because sometimes you just get one person at the desk, but a lot of times here we seem to get groups. So we'll get a group that's working on a project, and we could have five people in a group asking the same research question. So again, we decide to put that in. Under duration, you would note down here how many minutes that transaction took. And under difficulty level, you as the person answering the question decide from left to right, we called it easy peasy all the way to my head hurts. So this is something that we as a staff got together and, and decided well, what do we need to be putting in here? What do we need to be recording? And again, you're going to look at reports that you have to hand in for reference statistics and also look at the system you have now. And again, you can change this along the way. Um, now, obviously, this is my account because it says entered by. So when you go in to enter a record, you type in the question that was asked. You type in the answer that you gave. It will timestamp it for when you're entering this in. And because that's me logged on, it puts my name on it. And then I would choose all of these different things. And I, this is something that we do when we're actively doing reference. But this is also something that we do when we're not on reference. So um, if I'm down in the archives and I, for example, I have an emeriti come in who's doing some research, I would go on to Lib Analytics and I would re record that as a reference transaction. So that's why we have other options here about where were you, because reference doesn't always happen at the reference desk. Sometimes it happens when you're walking through the library or walking across campus and somebody you know, recognizes you and they have a question, or if you actually have an appointment with someone. Um, and so that's why we have all these different options here. And I wanted to spend a lot of time on this page because this is very important when you're setting up your Lib Analytics to get this template down. Um, but, so once you have this down and you're starting to enter in your questions, and again, the public cannot see this. This is you keeping track of your reference queries. So after you've built your, I'll call it a database of reference queries, and again, only the staff can see this, you can, of course, get your statistics, which was the big thing that was that was pushing this for us. So um, on the orange toolbar, there's going to be an option for statistics. I'm not showing that here, but um, this is what you would see. So I can put in here that I would like to get statistics for questions answered by everybody, or I could pick from our list of all of our staff. So I can generate statistical reports. So this is giving me a list of every single question that's been answered in our Lib Analytics. And again, I, I emphasize only the staff can see this. Um, so for example, I gave a, a presentation up to our friends group the other day about the status of our archives. We were closed for three years and we just reopened. And they wanted to know how many people are really using archives how many how many reference questions are you getting Jane and I was able to go into Lib Analytics because I had put in the questions I'd been getting and the answers and I could give them statistics back of what kinds of questions I've been getting and um, the number of questions I've been getting and also who had been asking the questions so this is a screen capture of again getting statistics and you can tell you can tell Lib Analytics um, 
do I just want to look at one thing from my template and this is where that template so important for your reference queries I can tell it um, I just want to see where were people when they got asked the question what kind of question was it I can find out who was asking the question and I can get back statistics about just those individual pieces of information so this is a pie chart of just who asked questions from certain time frames so back on the statistics page I can say I want to know who asked questions from this date to this date and I want it back in a pie chart or I want it back in a line chart or um, a bar column chart and this is one of the reasons that we really love Lib Analytics because it can give us this information back that was so hard to get from those pieces of paper that we were all putting those tick marks on and this is where I asked it I just want to see what kinds of questions are we getting for a certain amount of time so I think it's a really powerful tool here uh, that can give you back all of these statistics so neatly uh, this is the information just to show you how it looks in a line chart um, so this is information on the question type so it can show you for example um, general library information has a high peak um, directions has a high peak printer assistance of course has a high peak archives is a little bit low because uh, we just reopened but it can show you that we are getting questions in the highs and lows and here's an example of another way you can get the statistics back in a bar column chart so the big thing um, with lib analytics that I can't stress more is to uh, involve everyone in the move um, and really you need to have regular training uh, staff turnover especially with our student workers and what we've done with our student workers is we have a, a generic student worker logon and we ask them to always be logged on on their side of the desk and we are constantly reminding everyone all the time each other the importance of logging in and putting in those reference queries because we need that information for later on for reports or just to show that that we're getting usage in certain areas um, I'm trying to think of what else uh, I can say about Lin Analytics it's it, we haven't had it for that long just a couple of years but it's it's just it's been wonderful and again the the good examples that I can give here are when people ask you know are these services being used or or do you really get questions on that uh, we can go back into Lib Analytics and we can show that statistically if we're recording it that we are answering these questions and we are providing these services or on the flip side we aren't getting the questions maybe we need to rethink that service or that area of reference and at the time that we got Lib Analytics it was free um, because we were only using one instance of it um, so maybe Talia can talk about that in a bit about the different prices but at the time um, when we went with it it was uh, free for us okay and I do see some questions had come in on the side and I see Ta thank you Talia um, the staff have time to log information for all questions um, you know sometimes what I'll do is if I'm having a really busy day I will go back to just jotting some notes down and then I will find I, I will schedule some time with myself to sit down and 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 log in the information you can change the timestamp so if my reference shift was in the morning and I was swamped or if I had um, consultation appointments with people in the archives and I was swamped I can go back later and I can recreate that and I can put in the, the date and the time that that transaction happened and record that information um, we do stress with the student workers though um, to try to be on top of it as they're getting questions to put it right in um, because there are so many of them and their shifts change so much but for staff it's much easier to manage what does one data set mean I have to let Talia answer that uh, we just have one set of and I think it's just because we have the one library if we had branches but I'll let I see Talia's answering we do have other libraries but they're uh, very remote and in the Adirondacks and they actually barely have Wi-Fi um, and it's not they actually don't even have reference desks um, they're um, 
one library you can only get to by a boat, and it's for people that go there for the summer. So we only have one instance for one library. The profile boxes on the on the lib guides. Um, it. Um, I like it because when when I'm giving a lecture to whatever group, uh, either it's a, a a group on campus, it's it's an existing class, it's a high school group. I'm off campus, that it gives some identity so people can go back to the LibGuide and say, oh yeah, Jane gave us that talk and, and I have some questions or I have some questions not related to this LibGuide but I need more information about something else and it, and it gives the picture and it gives your contact information so it gives ownership and it gives you identity. Are there any other questions about Lib Analytics or Lib Answers? So Lib Analytics is the behind the scenes keeping track of your reference statistics. I, I can't express to everyone how fantastic this has been for us. And going back, Lib Answers is what we are calling Frequently Asked Questions, where it builds a database of questions and answers for patrons to search. I'm just watching the chat box to see if there's any other questions coming through. Jane, any well, other questions? Caroline's coming on now. Yeah. Hi. I'm, sign on for I am going to um, unmute Talia so she can answer questions without having yeah, to type them. She could answer that. I think the answer is yes, but I'll let her answer. <laughs> yeah. And um, I just wanted to um, remind both that just jumping in for a second to remind both of you that we're recording this, but the chat. Um, the words in the chat don't get recorded, so if you wouldn't mind just repeating any questions that are asked because that won't get into the final recording. And um, before we get to the formal q and I just wanted to say, Jane, thank you so much. And I oh, um, just want to give you give you a little bit of applause here if everyone wants oh, to I, give. I love sharing this. I, I just, you know, I think back to how we used to do it, and I think, gosh, if we could help some other people get on board. It's it's, it is difficult to make the move initially, but it's been well worth it. Great. Um, okay, so I'm going to switch over to... Uh, Talia, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Just came up um, about Lib Analytics. Yes. Um, so there was a fantastic uh, presentation, Jane. Thank you so much. Um, oh, thank I you. Was furiously taking notes because you had some such great points that you were and, and I think that the PowerPoint's going to be up or you're going to email it to the attendees um yes at the um when I get the the final recording up I'm going to email uh, the presentation and email the presentation that you have um, of version one so it's if anyone here is still on version one um, and wants to see what the screenshots look like in the previous version, you'll be able to follow along with that as well. Um, and that's actually up on our website now, so you'll be able, so anyone can access that. And I think that's all that I have for those. So yeah, and if anyone needs any other like information, I please send me an email and I will forward it your way. So um, I just wanted to address uh, um, a couple of the questions that came in about Lib Analytics. So um, as Jane was saying, it's really perfect for collecting like qualitative and quantitative data that you that you get into the library. And Jane's using it for reference statistics, which is awesome. Um, but lots of you know lots of academics use it for collecting instruction stats. You know how many classes did you teach? How many students in the class? What did you cover? How long did the class take? you know, those kinds of things. People use it to track their professional development activity. I was at Johnson & Wales um, as a, a librarian there uh, five years ago. And we had to do an annual review in June, if that sounds familiar for you guys. And every June, I forgot what I did last September. So I was chronically kind of under-reporting my own professional development activities and behavior. So you can even use Lib Analytics to track professional development activity 
and things like that. So to clarify it, uh, Lib Analytics is completely separate from LibGuides. You don't need to have LibGuides to have Lib Analytics. It's an entirely separate tool or web application, um, you know, completely separate. And we are still giving away one free data set for free. So if you are interested in getting um, Lib Analytics with one free data set, and one data set is equivalent to um, like collecting one bit of data. And, and by bit, I don't mean like one piece of data. I mean one kind of um, desk or kind of concept of data. So for example, you would use reference statistics as a data set. Um, and then instruction statistics would be a separate data set. So we are giving away one free data set, um, and you're more than welcome to email me. I forgot to put my email address in the slide there, <laughs> Carolyn. Dote, doe moment. Um, so I'm putting um, my... Put, um, my <laughs> oh, yeah, put it in the chat. There you go. <laughs> so it's in the chat box. Um, and so if you're, if you're keen on that, um, feel free to email me, and we'll, we'll get you set up. Any other questions? Any questions at all? Lib guides, lib answers, lib analytics. And for those of you who are kind of thinking statistically, you know, you're you're thinking about stats, you're thinking about um, starting 2016, you know, in a statistical mindset. We do have a new tool that is the sister tool to lib analytics. So Jane, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but it's kind of the, the sister tool, and, and it's called Live Insight, and it's a it's a big data tool for libraries. Basically, it does everything that Lib Analytics does, plus it has um, integration options for you to have um, your e-journal statistics, your circulation statistics, your database statistics, your gate count stats, your website statistics. So it becomes a one stop portal for literally all of your library stats from circulation and acquisitions to interlibrary loan to database and e-journal stats to reference statistics and instruction stats. So it's the um, it's the big sister tool of Lib Analytics, which is what Jane was presenting on, and it's relatively new. So if you're thinking about that as well, let me know. So I just wanted to share that in case you haven't heard of um, Lib Insight either. Um, Joan is asking a question. Does the pricing change with the number of products bought? Great question, Joan. So um, the we do have a discount if you come on board with the um, SpringShare suite. Um, so the SpringShare suite is our suite of tools, and it includes um, LibGuides um, CMS, which is the platinum version of LibGuides. Um, it includes um, LibAnswers, LibCal, our calendaring tool, Lib Analytics. Um, as well as our Lib Staffer tool, which is our staffing tool for you to, you know, schedule workers and schedule people for, um, you know, student workers or pages, as well as, you know, scheduling librarians for their shifts on chat reference, you know, things like that. So it's our scheduling tool. Um, so there is a discount if you get the whole SpringShare suite rather than buying them kind of one by one. I don't have the exact discount price. It all is dependent upon, you know, FTE and things like that. So, so Joan, you'd want to email uh, email me, and I'll get you in touch with your um, sales consultant. Linda um, is asking, what is the cost of more than one data set? Let's say five. Um, Linda, so I'm actually not on the sales team, so I am not privy to the. Uh, they, they don't trust me with the purse strings, as I like to say. So what I will do is I will connect you with your um, sales consultant who would be happy to give you a like a like a written uh, quote of five data sets. But um, just so you know, Linda, the next tier after the free data set is five. So it's like the next one right after that. And then it's 10 and then it's 20. What we end up seeing traditionally is folks who start with Lib Analytics start with the free data set. And then they're like, oh my gosh, I could use this for my instruction stats. Oh, and I can, you know, use it for my professional development. Oh, and I want to track, you know, foot traffic. Um, I want to use it to, to um, I, the several public libraries use it for um, book purchase request forms because 
um, there is a public facing side of it where you can create a data set that has a form that you can utilize for your patrons to fill out um, and essentially record a transaction or record a recording a form records a transaction and then you can run really in-depth statistical reports and, be, and say things like how many you know book purchase requests did we get in the month of February that is um, have been approved with this particular cost code so um, what ends up happening is you, most people start with one and then kind of boom um, increase after that Any other questions? I think I see Stephanie typing, so I will. Oh, um, Stephanie is uh, interested in knowing more about having a private libguide. Um, oh, okay. So Stephanie, how a private libguide remains private is, so in, in libguides, there are three different statuses to a guide. Um, unpublished is unpublished, and all guides start out as unpublished. Um, then there's published, which means I've published it, I've made it available on the World Wide Web, it is now indexed and searchable by search engines. And then there's private. Private guides are only accessible if somebody knows the URL to it. Um, they are not indexed um, by search engines, so if you were to search on it in Google, um, it would not appear. So the only way to access a private guide is to know the exact link to it. Um, so it's kind of a, a midpoint um, as between kind of published. Um, it, it, it is accessible. Um, you don't have to log in. You don't have to type a password to access it. Um, you just have to know the link. Um, but if you were putting, for example, um, information on there that needs to be more protected, like database passwords, for example, um, and you needed to have it be a little bit more protected, you would then want the, um, the LibGuide CMS, which is the upgrade to LibGuides, and that has IP restrictions and password restrictions as well. So hopefully, Stephanie, that kind of gives you an idea about what a private guide um, is. It's basically just accessible if you know the URL. And it would just mean that, you know, I create a LibGuide, I mark it as private, and I send it out in an email. But that doesn't prevent somebody who receives that email from then forwarding it along to 50 other people or posting it on like Facebook or Twitter um, and then everybody then has access to it. So it's private in the sense that only people who know the link can get to it um, and it's not you know searchable on the, it's not indexed um, by search engines. Any other questions? If you're on, speaking of Twitter, if you're on Twitter, um, you can chat with me um, using at Springshare. I am frequently on our social media accounts. So if you have any questions or you, um, you know, you're, you're a user of any of our tools and you're active on Twitter, we frequently post really great examples um, as well as like cool guides that have been built or, you know, really, really innovative uses of systems. Um, so if you're constantly looking for inspiration, um, you might get some by following us at, at Springshare. Great. Well, Talia, thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, just waiting. I think we should just wait a minute or two to see if there's any more questions. But um, it looks like we're everyone's burning, burning questions have been answered here. Um, Talia or Jane, do you have anything else to add before we uh, end the meeting? Um, actually, I was just going to ask Talia a question. Talia, you can get probably a, a demo of, um, I, we just went ahead and bought it, but you can probably get like a demo version people that want to try it out. Oh, yes, yeah. You can get request um, a webinar or and, and access to a, um, a demo to play around with it yourself of all of our tools. So if you wanted, say, like a 30-minute webinar to get a little bit more information, absolutely possible. And if you're like, you know what, I want a 30-day trial so I can play in it myself and have all my coworkers play with the tool to get a really good feel for it, that's absolutely possible, too. The other thing that I found really helpful, Oh, and too. I wanted to mention, hmm? I was just going to say, Jane, something super exciting that um, we just, um, so you guys are all kind of getting uh super super 
insider information right now because it just was announced yesterday. So for if you're um, thinking about lib answers and you you know are like, oh, we really want lib answers, but we're a 24/7 library and we want to have chat reference services at three in the morning. Um, we are actually partnering with the Virtual Librarian Service, which has a staff of professional and credentialed librarians, um, where you can basically have a LibAnswer system, utilize it during your you know, normal business hours, and then if you also wanted to have 24-7 chat reference service and your, library, your librarians are not there at 4 in the morning to answer chat questions, you can get the Virtual Librarian Service to have pretty much 24-7 um, staffing, essentially. So if, if that's of interest of anybody, um, feel free to email us and I'll, I'll get you more information on that as well. And I, I was just going to mention, um, you were saying you could get you know, a, de a demo or get a webinar, but um, we, we, had, we had just purchased the product. And um, what we found really helpful is, again, looking at, I can't emphasize it, where the community sites for SpringShare because you can see the other lib guides that people have done and the other uh, lib answers that people have done to get ideas for topics. Um, again, you can ask people if you can reuse information from their guides. And for lib answers, that really helped us with pre-populating our database of questions and answers. So I can't emphasize more that that wonderful supportive uh, community where everything is shared on the SpringShare community sites. Yeah, in fact, I found a really uh, fantastic LibGuide um, a couple of hours ago published by Long Island University in Brooklyn, and it's on their ba it's a banned books LibGuide, and they actually highlight and feature the books that have been challenged from within their own collection, which I think is just fantastic. Um, so I put the link in the chat box if anybody's interested in checking it out. Cool. Well, thank you both again. Um, uh, if there's nothing else, I'm going to go ahead and end the recording. Um, and um, I want to thank everyone, everyone who's still here, who stuck around to the very end. Uh, it was great having you here. And please look to our website for a link to this recording, some of the presentation materials, and an evaluation that will be coming to you via email shortly.